Welcome to Nepal. Thank you so much. You climb the Mount Everest, right? That's where I'm going. Yeah. Kathmandu. It is here that I will begin to explore the captivating country of Nepal. In Nepal, Pasipati Nath is biggest temple. Yes, yeah, she will. That walk. ended in 2006, right? Yeah, yeah, she will walk here. And the next bank you can see the body cremation is happening there. I've never been to this country before. I've never been to the Kumbu Valley. I've never been to Mount Everest. It's not about this mountain. It's about you guys. Becoming a mountain guide, it's not easy. I want to say all girls, you should come and you can you can follow your dream. To come to it looks okay. And after that, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> what piece of advice would you give someone? If you want to climb the mountain and go back to your home, I just uh, prepare for it before you come here. Be scared and be intimidated and be humble. There's a lot of crevasse, open crevasse. I came to Nepal on a quest to explore this captivating country, but I leave with so much more. start with your background and you know we'll, we'll get into the film and and all of the rigors of that as well but but this you mentioned quite a bit in in the film this was a lifelong dream this was a promise that you had to make to to accomplish climbing everest we've seen so many movies about about this journey we've seen uh, there's been fictional movies that have right. been made about everest and climbing everest and of course horror films even uh, about that I'm kind of curious, knowing that this was a personal journey and then filming it and, and figuring all that out, why did you want to approach it the way you approached it? And what what was it about it that you figured out that you wanted to make this film a little bit different than any other film that has ever been done about Everest? Well, I mean, I think there's a thing that came to me originally was this aha moment. I was standing on the summit of Denali or Mount McKinley in Alaska. Uh, which is the highest mountain in North America. And I'm standing there up there all by myself with only one other person, my climbing partner. And it's 1130 at night because when you climb it, there's eternal sun up there. So that's an odd thing to begin with, to be standing somewhere at 1130 at night and you still have the sure. sun up. <laughs> so, you know, standing out of A little disconcerting. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and it's like, it's almost apocalyptic, right? You just see this <laughs> orange glow all around you. <laughs> and, and I'm standing up there all by myself with just my climbing partner. And, you know, you're to 20,320 feet, a rigorous climb to get to the top of that mountain. And then I was looking out over the expanse of the Alaska range. And I said to myself, as great and as beautiful as this scene is and as surreal as it is. And part of that goal that I had at that time was to climb the seven summits, the highest point on each continent, Denali being, of course, the highest one in North America. I said to myself, I can't just do this to have this amazing view, be it five minutes, be 15 minutes, or the fortune had it on Everest 45 minutes, you know, have this view all by yourself on the top of one of these peaks and risk your life. You have to reprogram your whole life in order to make these things happen. Arduous amount of training, a lot of preparation, and of course, a ton of international travel. And I said, I've got to do something bigger with this. And that's where that light bulb went off about, okay, let's make this into a film production. Let's because I know that the majority of the world will never have a chance to step foot on Denali. And I know that 99.9% .9 of the world will never have a chance to step foot on Everest. So I was like, okay, let's do this in a way that gives people that come along with this journey that I honor to myself, you know, the most realistic or the deepest depiction of what it's like to go on a 52 day Everest expedition, as well as use that as a hook to tell you the rest of the story. And the rest of the story, as you know, by seeing the film, is about Nepal. 
You know, it's about the Hinduism, the Buddhism, the communist civil war, and how integrated Nepal is to the identity of Everest and vice versa. And so I think that kind of really differentiates it in many ways that we really dig deep into the cultural aspects of things. Yes, I mean, the drone shots and the great climbing shots and the interviews, and all the things that we see on Everest, we think, you know, maybe significantly different than some of the other stuff you see. But more importantly, it's about the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is to tell what Nepal is all about and its association with that adventure of Mount Everest. Yeah, it's uh, and, and the interesting thing, too, is they probably have had hundreds of film crews run through them time after time and and do that you know go to everest and and film and or try to attempt to film or however you want to look at it but uh, i'm curious did the city of nepal embrace the opportunity to be featured did they did they give you any did you have to go through any different hoops that you would you know that you've never experienced before was was there resistance because part of a documentarian's journey is getting the subject to trust them and be a part of it and you had a whole city that you had to do that with correct and you know so a lot of that because it's not like a controlled environment you know you being in the yeah. film business knowing that where you can set up shots stage shots it's a lot of run and gun, a lot of improvising, especially in a chaotic environment like Kathmandu, like you're talking about. You know, yeah. the, hus the hustle and bustle there puts New York to shame, you know. <laughs> and so a lot of it is you plan, you lay out the day as best you can, you figure what you want to try to accomplish with the subject matter at hand, and then you just got to be able to improvise. And mm -hmm. I'm humbly honored and fortunate to have had a radio show for three and a half years that was an improv comedy show. So... I have a lot of background in, in being able to just stick and move in whatever situation you throw me in. <laughs> and, but it still comes down to your personal relationships, yeah. right? At the end of the day, they see you and I, you know, I stick out like a sore th thumb. I'm six foot four, you know, before I left, I was about 200 pounds. So I was easily spotted. And, you know, you have people when you're going, for example, to Pashupati Nath Temple that you see early on in the movie where you have the, you know, the Hindu uh, burials and, you know, the rites of passage and the cremations and stuff going on. People look at you, you know, and but then once you start to speak with them and, and you they get to understand that you're trying to show their world and to show what their culture is all about, not so much as look at me, I'm in your culture. No, I really want to kind of highlight your culture to the outside world, then they kind of get that sense of trust with you. And then they're willing to open up, disclose, and tell you things that, you know, you're not even expecting, you know. And so at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, we came back with 63 hours of footage, you know, and chopped that down <laughs> to 72 minutes. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we had to choose from. And so, you know, picking and, and choosing what was, A, authentic to those people and to the culture of Nepal, and B, I think what would drive the narrative from beginning to end, you know, was kind of the way we en ended up uh, going about the way we did. My name is Alex Harz. I just arrived in one of the most surreal cities in the world, Kathmandu. It is here that I will begin to explore the captivating country of Nepal and start a quest to fulfill my childhood promise of climbing the highest mountain on earth, Mount Everest. This is my quest. You know, the interesting thing about documentaries that I've, oh, I, I love talking to documentarians about is the idea that you do have something solid. You might have a game plan. You might even, you might even be winging it. Who knows? But then you get in there, you, 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 you schedule your interviews, you put everything together. But at some point during the process, whether it be at, at the moment when you're interviewing people or you find something you wanted to capture, the entire subject matter kind of it, it's like a flame it goes wherever it wants to go and kind of changes on you was there a point in in this film that you felt like uh you were doing something different than what you had originally planned yes 
Yeah, a couple times, actually. There's a scene that we don't show in the film, or at least not in this rendition of it. Maybe on a longer cut, we will, at this place called the Kopa Monastery, which sits up above Kathmandu. It's mm-hmm. a Buddhist monastery. It's it's an amazing place. It's very hard to get access to. You know, not even Nat Geo can film there. The reason we were able to film there was because of the relationships that we built directly, you know, family relationships that monks that actually were there and that were directly part of the quest and therefore we were able to get access and when you sit there in those surreal environments and serene environments everything changes what you thought what you wanted to talk about i just let this buddhist monk go uh, talk for 45 minutes about the lord buddha himself and the the path of enlightenment you know the stuff that you might want to drizzle about but you can't get too deep into because you don't have a lot of time and b a lot of people just don't understand it so you're you know you're kind of hitting them in the head with something that might lose them right Mm-hmm. But at, at that moment, and then the other moment, which you do see in the film at Pashupatinath, when you see those burning bodies, you know, you see five mm-hmm. or six bodies laid out, you know, Game of Thrones style, old school, yeah. you know, and it takes three to five hours to burn a human body that way. And you're smelling like a campfire, but that's because of human, you know, remains, not because you're sitting roasting marshmallows in Yosemite. <laughs> <laughs> those are the moments that, yep, this is a little bit more than I anticipated and it wasn't really what I was planning, but let's go with it. Let's see where this goes and let's just embrace, you know, the moment that we're in. Mm. You also have an experience that I don't think much, uh, many filmmakers get, and that is you're, you're front and center, but you're also on a side of a mountain climbing uh, as much as you can up a mountain wall filming and, and directing and there's no way you could have saw dailies or anything like that. Maybe you stopped and watched the camera once in a while, but there's no way to have prepared the shots because the mountain is is its own life form as well. And I'm kind of curious from that perspective, the, you know, did you mentally prepare for that before climbing? Did you did did you talk? Did you guys pre-plan? Was there pre-production? involved in that because you wouldn't be able to see this footage until you were back in the states editing it right exactly so i mean uh, let's put it this way we did a lot of planning you know i did a lot of investigation on everest you know i dreamt about it since i was a young boy as you hear about in the film Uh, and everything that i visualized everything i've seen i've seen everything you can imagine read everything i can imagine went through formal mountaineering training for years and years and years all for that moment Uh, but as soon as i stepped foot in the kumbu icefall threw it all out the window (laughs) <laughs> every, every everything that I thought I knew about Everest and everything I prepared for, it was a different ball game because as soon as you step foot in that ice fall, it's like playing Russian roulette, and it's just it's literally right place, right time, wrong place, wrong time, and and so then you're like, okay. The ice wall itself moves at six feet a day up to six feet a day downhill, so it's constantly changing. So you never go through the ice fall the same way. And you have to go up and down the mountain a couple times to acclimatize your body, so you just don't go in one sitting up Everest. Right. I mean, takes nine days to trek there and then it takes another 43 days to climb it so it's a long long process and then of course being the first time to everest i didn't have a reference point of okay i've been to camp one before i've been to camp two camp three camp four south call you know the the balcony hillary step never been to these places i've only seen them on on movies and so when you actually have to get there and try to set up shots and then plan it and then still climb and then not fall into a crevasse or get hit by an avalanche and all the different things that happen or your battery's freezing or your camera's fogging up or not working at all because it's 40 below zero. All these different scenarios you can think you plan for, but then when you get there, you just got to deal with it. And then first and foremost, the biggest limiting factor to even getting any of this content is being able to climb the mountain. And that, of course, is by far the hardest thing I've ever done, even being a college athlete. That was a walk in the park compared to climbing Everest. It's time! That's rock and roll. Just follow me when you're ready.
Nowhere in the world will we climb a huge maze of collapsing ice towers the size of cars and buildings to reach a summit, except on Mount Everest. How are we doing? Good, man. <laughs> yeah, the latter scenes are very, very interesting. Uh, I, I would imagine you had a GoPro or something like that on you when you guys were climbing the ladders, but it, but it, that the way it shook from the wind and everything, I mean, you really get a real good sense of how what you must have been feeling at, at that point. It's very well, interesting. Well, picture going to Home Depot, buying some cheap aluminum ladders, and then stringing them together with fishing string, throw them across <laughs> a 50-foot expanse, and then try to walk on them with one inch of purchase on your front and on your back and hope you don't fall through the rungs. And that's, like you're right, they bounce up and down because of the swaying of the body weight and because yeah. they're being held together by fishing string. And then, of course, wind and so on. And the angle of the crevasse, it's not like a nice, perfectly flat level ground like your great driveway it's uh <laughs> it's, it's a complete mess <laughs> no matter how you go about it so you just got to kind of deal with it but that's why you see those those shots that way because that's really what it's like you know? did you uh, did you guys put the vr thing together first or what was the movie did the movie come and then you guys started to, to work with the vr experience idea so the vr experience was something that once we decided to go i said okay we're all we're all in on this thing and, you know, there's a lot of commitment, a lot of risk, a lot of sacrifice taking place. And then I said, you know, I had this dumb idea. I said, well, hold on a second. I'm here anyway. I'm risking my life to do this. Why don't I take a, another step further and be even dumber and try to record this whole thing in VR? And so, so that's how that came about. And then I said, well, okay, how can I film this in VR to give it the closest possible experience of what it's like to climb Everest without being dumb enough to get off the couch and try it yourself? And the idea came is that I'm a video game junkie. I love first-person shooters, your Halo, Gears of War kind of stuff. And so I said, okay, what if I did a first-person over-the-shoulder style shot in VR? So you're actually looking down my shoulder, you're looking into the crevasse, you're standing on the Hillary step, you're looking around as if you're me versus, as you know, from a third-person perspective, as cool as that is in VR, you're still watching it unfold in front of you versus being actually in the scene. And so that was the dumb idea. So I was like, okay, well, why don't I strap this VR camera to my back? <laughs> and then let's, uh, while I'm filming the 2D, let's also film the VR and climb this thing and see if we can get it all. And again, I'm humbly honored and fortunate to have come down with 63 hours of content. There is no place like the country of Nepal. And there's no adventure quite like going on an epic 52 day expedition to try to climb the highest and most legendary mountain on earth, Mount Everest. what it's like to tiptoe across swaying aluminum ladders and weave your way through the deadliest maze on earth as you climb to the vertical limits of what is humanly possible with explorer Alex Harz on a one-of-a-kind real-life virtual reality quest to the top of the world. Was there was there talk about doing like a before you went and then I mean you did a little bit of after but you were really most of it was after like literally after mm -hmm. uh, for spoiler alert he makes it to the top everybody I, I don't think that you know I don't think there's a, a, a 
we wouldn't be talking if he didn't make it to the top, I think. But, 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 uh, you know, you, you do spend time in the, in the, in the hikers cafe and everything like that. The, the wonderful things that we know about Everest that when you accomplish that, you get to experience. And, uh, but that's where it ends. Did you ever have, I mean, obviously you had 63 hours of footage, so you didn't need this, but was there ever a plan to kind of do a prep before and, and maybe do some after a little bit down the road kind of idea? Yeah, there was actually, we have some filming of some training that, that I did, you know, cause I was training seven days a week, you know, for a whole year with no exceptions, two to three hours a day, stop drinking all that stuff to prepare myself physically for the climb. And so we have some of that documented uh, and we were going to document some of the post stuff, but then once what we got back to Kathmandu, you know, it just kind of chaotic nature of at the end of an Everest expedition, uh, that's kind of hard to then try to, you know, get, get saddled back up to to energize the film the everyone is just wanting to eat everything they can drink everything they can and then just sleep as much as they can and so uh you know that was kind of thrown out the window <laughs> <laughs> and then of course i was flying back around the world i had to go through malaysia then I had to go through the philippines and japan sure. so by the time i got back home it was over another month uh from yeah. the time i left Kathmandu. so at that point uh, you know it was already the writing on the wall but as you may have read or may not have read, it's an ongoing series. So it's an ongoing yeah. immersive series. So we already have the next four iterations kind of laid out, uh, depending on the time of year, depending on geopolitical factors, on whether or not we can go to these locations, COVID, you know, as well. And uh, so at the end of this summer, uh, beginning of the fall, we'll start to lay out where we're going to go next and probably nice. use a very similar model to what we did here. Is the training going to be similar or do you feel uh, now that you've had uh, acclimatized yourself to that you can train a little bit less? I mean, I, it's it's going to be similar, but not as uh, extensive. And, and it's right. that, that has to do with the locations that we go to. And it's going to be case sure. by case. So each different location is going to dictate the amount of training that's needed and how intense it is, because the one thing you don't want to do is ramp yourself up you know, tear your body down and then all of a sudden something happens and you don't go. So it's, you want to prepare when you know everything's set in stone. Okay. we got the flights. we got these locations. We're going here. All right. So now let's train for the next three months, four months, you know, again, seven days a week and get ready for this. But I uh, highly doubt, I should say knock on wood, not likely that any of my training moving forward from here is going to be nearly as arduous as it was going forever. Yeah, well, yeah, climbing the highest peak in the world, you, you you almost feel like Superman at that point, you know, I would imagine. Well, you know, it's funny because that mountain is kryptonite. Yeah. <laughs> I, I left here in the best shape of my life. Um, I was about 197 pounds, 4 to 6% body fat. I was running one to two marathons a week. And by the time I got back to Kathmandu, I was 170 pounds. I lost 27 pounds of pure muscle mass, had nerve damage wow. on all 10 of my toes. And uh, I was the lightest that I was since I graduated high school. <laughs> wow. So. The things we do to, to make art, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. There's always that fine borderline between insanity and, and making a calculated <laughs> decision. <laughs> Are the is the series going to reflect like like this movie does, where you do a little bit about the city you're in, and then and then climb them and do the climb? Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, exactly. So we're going to use again in, in the upcoming insta installments, uh, adventure as the hook to tell you the rest of the cultural stories, you know. And so so that kind of meshes a little bit. You know, essentially, if you want to break it down into three known names, you know, that people like to do a lot in Hollywood, take Werner Herzog, mix him with Anthony Bourdain and a little bit of Bear Grylls. And that's kind of what you got. You got these epic <laughs> quests, you know, to try to tell these deep cultural stories and rarely seen stories that you normally wouldn't see, especially in the West. You know, we, we are very sheltered when it comes to content like this, because, you know, let's be honest, a lot of people, if you go down the street and ask them where's Nepal, they couldn't tell you where it was on the map. And, yeah. if, and if you didn't know about Mount Everest, you would never know about Nepal. So that's why we use Everest to tell you the rest of the story about Nepal. And so we'll use a lot of that kind of uh, philosophy for the other installments as well. So we can really dig deep into these rarely seen stories that you don't see and then hopefully get you entertained and get you educated along the way. 
how different I, I obviously this is a life ex, a life-changing experience and uh, you know you're a different human being as you mentioned you're physically different and mentally different i would imagine and spiritually different and everything like that but i'm kind of curious did are you different now as a filmmaker from having this experience is there something that you took away that you're going to adapt to the next thing you do yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because originally my filmmaking prowess or chops was, was more into comedy and it was mm -hmm. more into dramatical stuff. And, you know, but, but ironically, my favorite style of filmmaking is twisted, dark comedy, off the wall stuff, you know, maybe even offensive to many. And, and then documentary filmmaking, really deep, rich, cultural Werner Herzog kind of stuff, you know, even interpersonal Bourdainish kind of stuff. So those, those dichotomies couldn't be farther apart from each other. But at the end of this uh, quest, it really told me that, okay, this is probably the road that I want to focus on with regards to my filmmaking perspective, as well as my filmmaking path versus going back to some of the other stuff I did that I really like, but I think that this might have more benefit for the overall audience on a long-term basis. Nice. So what is it, Alex, that you love about being indie? What is it about indie film that you just gravitate toward? Well, I think what I gravitate uh, most towards about it is the freedom and the diversity of be, to be able to do what you think is the story you want to tell, right? Whether or not you ever finish that story, because as you know, as an indie filmmaker, you know, it's, it's a tough road. And mm -hmm. whether or not you get to continue to tell stories, you don't know. But what you do know is you have a passion, you have an ability. If you have the, the luck and the fortune and the timing to put it all together, you know, you can do something that you're not constrained by, let's say, other forms of media or even if you're in more of a structured environment in a filmmaking environment. So I think that's probably what I like the most is say, okay, I can collaborate with people that have a very similar philosophy or have a similar vision on what you want to do with XYZ film. And there's really no handcuffs on it as long as you're able to stick it through. And that's something that indie film offers that I don't think that your traditional filmmaking uh, give you that, gives you that luxury all the time to do. Hello, my name is Alex Harz. As a filmmaker, mountaineer, and radio host, I want to utilize these diverse skills to take you on a one-of-a-kind quest. As a kid growing up in Omaha, Nebraska, on the American Great Plains, I began dreaming of climbing big mountains. When I moved to the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, I fell in love with mountaineering and rock climbing. I have climbed many mountains, among them the highest peaks in North and South America. With years of high altitude mountaineering experience under my belt, my quest is now leading me to climb the most iconic mountain in the world, Everest. Join me on a live streaming adventure like nothing seen before and help me make history every step along the way. Thank you for supporting this unique project.